Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, live webinar, this live talk from the Museum of Movements. My name is Ana Maria Bermeo, and I am sitting at an empty <laughs> museum venue. I'm only sharing the space with Temi Orimosu, sitting here as well, as you can see. So we are sitting in the city of Malmö in southern Sweden, and the Museum of Movements is a museum in the making in this uh, city. It's a national museum. It's expected to open in 2025. And it's a museum for migration and democracy with the perspective from the civil society. And MME, Migration Memory Encounters, is one of the projects uh, under the umbrella of the Museum of Movements. And uh, it's a platform for artists who are not well established is right now in this, uh, its third year and it will finish uh, sometime in the fall. So we'll keep you all posted of what happens to migration memory encounters. And uh, the Q&A is open and available for all of you. So do use it. Uh, we'll make sure to answer your questions and we'll try to make this very inclusive and great. So I leave the word to Temi now. Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Temi Odomosu and uh, I'm here sitting next to Anna Maria. It's very strange in this time of social media and digitality to be facing you, but next to this woman and then you, it looks like anyway. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, we are going to basically be having a discussion about museums as structures that impress and express and that, um, that in this particular moment in time, in, in 2020, with everything that's going on in the world, are definitely up for reconsideration, for reevaluation. We're, it's interesting being in the Museum of Movements, which is a, a museum without a collection, um, in an open space, um, and a museum in the making. And so it doesn't have some of the historical baggage that the museums that uh, Nivi Christensen and Brandy McDonald are going to talk about. But this is a good opportunity to think about like, what's the way forward for these kinds of structures, the structures mm -hmm. that we would call the museum? Um, what kinds of things can we do in these spaces? How can we tell histories in a more equitable, uh, more inclusive way? Or is it even possible to kind of break free from the coloniality of the museum as a concept, as a sort of temple for, of knowledge, as it were, from a historical perspective? So all of these things we're going to sort of like dance around um, with these two fantastic women who we are calling museum change makers. So the panel is titled after them. Um, and so we're just going to leave uh, and Nivi Christensen, who is in Greenland, and Brandy McDonald, who's joining us from San Diego, so different time zones, to introduce themselves. And then they will talk for about 10 minutes each. And then we will enter into a sort of fluid dialogue and hopefully include your own questions as well if you have them. So please, uh, we start with Brandy McDonald. Hello, Chokma. Uh, Brandy MacDonald. Hi, I am uh, Brandy MacDonald. Um, I am a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Um, I'm also of ancestral ties to the Choctaw Nation. Uh, and I'm the director of decolonizing initiatives at San Diego Museum of Man. Uh, and then the language I just spoke is um, uh, the Chickasaw Southern dialect, but also is um, the Choctaw language as well. And since I'm um, connected to both, um, both on my mother's side, um, I try and speak the Southern dialect to represent both of my communities. Um, I identify as indigenous uh, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am going to do my best to share my screen, so bear with me y'all. Um, and then do a screen share. Okay, oops, let me back up. Sorry. Um, so uh, this is our, the museum. It's in San Diego. Uh, and as you can see, our museum uh, is ornately decorated. Uh, the museum was uh, established in 1915 as a part of the um, Panama Exposition uh, in San Diego and Balboa Park. Um, our facade is a monument to the colonizer. Uh, it has 13 um, 
conquistadors, missionaries, colonizers um, etched into it um, who have actively perpetrated genocide and colonial harm and forced and violent assimilation on indigenous people in the California area, but also just beyond. Uh, and so we want to recognize this. Um, our building is a historic monument built in 1915. It also is owned by the city. And so we as a museum, um, we don't own our building. We lease it from the city and we've leased it um, up since our inception. Uh, but we have always been an uh, anthropology museum. And so we're also deeply embedded within the colonial endeavor and we're birthed from the colonial endeavor as well. So it's a really interesting space to be embarking on decolonizing initiatives when <laughs> your beginning was colonization and, every, and, and so many points within your history are. And so we want to make sure that we're fully transparent about that um, because part of, uh, for us at least, part of decolonizing initiatives is uh, truth telling and accountability. Um, another part of that is that we recognize that we are privileged to be sitting um, and to reside and to hold space uh, on the ancestral unceded homeland of the Kumeyaay Nation. The Kumeyaay are the indigenous people of San Diego and beyond. Um, Particularly, it's also past the, um, the Kumeyaay people are over the border in the Baja area of Mexico, the border across them, the imaginary border. Um, the Kumeyaay peoples have been here since time immemorial and continue to steward the land. Um, and they also continue to maintain their political sovereignty and their cultural traditions to this day. A footprint of our museum. Our museum uh, holds about 75,000 ethnographic objects from around the world. I'm not going to read these line by line. I'm just kind of going to hit some of the, the major points. Um, but uh, we, when we're thinking about uh, who we represent through our cultural resources and who we have harmed through the colonial endeavor th with our cultural resources, it's predominantly indigenous people. Uh, when we think about it's about 250, as we know right now, indigenous communities represented within the United States and then more than 400 indigenous communities um, globally or internationally, uh, and then 20 non-Indigenous communities represented internationally. We also hold around 7,500 um, ancestral human remains. We are actively repatriating ancestors uh, and take, giving them back to their communities, returning them back to their home. Um, uh, but we're also finding ancestors every day. And so this number, while we may be repatriating community members, um, it is still kind of sitting in this static number, uh, and yet people are still going home. Uh, but we're also finding people that we didn't know about when we're um, further inventorying our cultural resources. So part of our decolonizing initiatives are we uh, recognize that um, decolonization is not static, it's fluid. Um, and it's going to consistently shift uh, based upon what the community needs, at least from our perspective and what in our experience, um, the community's needs are going to shift uh, and the indigenous communities, depending on the generation or what's happening in society. And so we really uh, sit in the space of guiding principles to kind of guide our work to make sure that we are staying true to the values and what and being authentic to you um, and accountable to what we're saying we're going to do. We have taken these guiding principles and we were inspired um, and um, uplifted through the work of Amy Lone Tree uh, and her, uh, her seminal work, uh, Decolonizing Museums. And so we pulled a lot from her scholarship uh, and then also connected with indigenous community members um, internationally to see kind of what are some guiding principles that they want us to instill. So we made sure that we were representing all communities and not just uplifting the ivory tower at the same time. And so these are our primary guiding principles. Um, truth telling and accountability, we're talking about our oppressive colonial legacy, uh, we rethinking ownership. And when we think about rethinking ownership, it's really shifting that practice to where we're recognizing that um, the ways that items came into our cultural resources and that cultural knowledge is not ours. It's never been ours, even though may, we may legally own it, it belongs to the community. Uh, it was taken um, without consent. And even if something is given to us with consent, it's still, it's still intangible cultural intellectual property. And so we wanna make sure we are honoring that and respecting that. And so this is deeply written within a lot of our cultural resources policies as well. Um, and then we're doing a, a major shift within our policies, thinking about um, internal languages, the way that we hold our cultural resources, repatriation, even thinking about governance and our holiday structure was shifting. Um, and then representation. We wanna make sure that we're having black indigenous and people of color representation at all levels of the decision-making so many times we see many of the BIPOC folk uh, and they are at the front door or they're at education. And so we want to shift that because that is not equitable. That is not accessible. Um, that's not decolonizing. The indigenous community members, black and community members, people of color need to be at all levels, um, including the top level of decision making and on our board. 
And so these guiding principles, I wanted to kind of show some examples of what this looks like in practice. And then I'll kind of pull some tangible examples from these. Um, the bold, uh, both in the policies and the procedures are the ones that we've already accomplished that we're continuing to work through and editing as we go. And the ones that are unbolded are the ones that we're working through. Um, and a few of them like the decolonizing initiative strategic plan, our name change, as you know, the Museum of Men, um, well, you may not know, but the Museum of Men, one from a DEI, diversity, equity, inclusive access perspective, is not necessarily um, DEI uh, and we're thinking about uplifting the patriarchy and it's also confusing like what does it look like uh, being museum of man what one man who just men uh, but then also thinking in, in a larger scale is that over 100 years we have perpetrated colonial harm and this name is a representation of colonial harm and what does it do to invoke um, trauma and pain uh, in indigenous communities globally as well. Uh, so we are looking to launch a new name in the fiscal year of 2021. Um, and so I'm going to kind of pull from some of my favorite pieces um, uh, as much as I can uh, within kind of my small little timeline as well. So I don't want to cut anybody's time short. So one of my favorite uh, parts here is when I think about policies um, is, as you can see, the second bullet point says Colonial Pathways Policy. So this was a policy that was unanimously voted in uh, by our board of trustees. And so what this is my favorite policy. I love policy. Uh, and what we want to make sure is that policies match procedures because you can change your structure and you can change your policy, but if the culture of the organization doesn't match, then it's not going to happen. It's just fancy words that I write or that someone writes and then they're there, but the institutional culture is going to keep doing what it's always been doing. And so we're looking at how do we shift both of those. Um, and the colonial policy is a really good example. We looked really strategically to make sure that we were bringing everybody along with us. So everyone believed it, including the board. So when it got to the board level to vote, it voted unanimously. And so essentially what this colonial pathways policy says is that anything, any item and cultural resource that came to of those 75 ethnographic items of the ancestral human remains, any of those pieces that came to us as belongings um, that came to us through a colonial pathway uh, needs to go back home. Uh, if the community wants it back home. If the community does not want it go back home, if they maybe want us to hold it and steward it for a while, or if they don't want it at all, then we ask how they, we get their consent to continue to hold it, and we ask how they want us to care for it. Um, and so uh, we get frequent questions um, around what is a colonial pathway? And so this is the way that we define a colonial pathway is thinking about inequitable, inequitable trade, thinking about the ways that um, uh, research has perpetrated colonial harm. Um, we have moments in our history, which is not unique to our history, um, this throughout the museum world where researchers have gone into spaces um, and under this umbrella of research, which is also sometimes under the umbrella of um, white supremacy and colonization, and then come back and extracted cultural resources and also use that data to spread that data so that it uh, contributes to the displacement of indigenous community members. Um, and we have those pieces within our cultural resources, specifically pieces um, that are weapons from Australia and also cultural resources from India as well. Um, and so we're also thinking about what does that look like around the removal of military activities um, and anything that's not uh, was not through consultation and was not consented by the community. And so we're actively doing um, consultations. Many people freak out and they're like, what are you talking about? You can't be a museum of nothing. Uh, this is going to be a completely, you can't repatriate anything. Um, and that is a, it's a valid fear. And I think that it is a fear that we hear frequently, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we have moments, even just within the last five years of when we're doing this, where we have actively tried to give things back to the community members and the community members have either, they it's usually around three things. They've either, ta either taken those um, cultural resources, they've either split them in half and said, we would like these uh, to continue uh, cultural repatriation within our community, um, or, and we want you to continue uh, telling our story in this way. And then we have this one, and I want to tell this story because I think it's wonderful, where we have Ambassador Ole Senkale from the Maasai, uh, the Maasai tribe, and uh, Ambassador Senkale came to visit us, and we pulled all of our cultural resources um, from, uh, that we knew that were from the Maasai tribe, or at least labeled Maasai, uh, sometimes they're mislabeled, and that's what we found. Uh, many of the cultural resources that you can see here were mislabeled. Uh, also, some of the cultural resources had poison on them that we did not know about, and he was like, you need to take care of this. Um, and then during this time of consultation, we continued to say, well, do you want them back? We would love to pay for the shipping because we have a line item for, we, we want to make sure that these items come back to you all. If this is what you want, if these need to go home, they're yours. It's a part of our policy. Um, and he kept saying no and kept saying no. And then he found uh, this, if it's the first uh, spear that's closest to the screen, um, furthest away from him. 
Uh, and he was like, are you all even taking care of this? Uh, and we're like, well, what do you mean? Our cultural resources is like, let me tell you about all the chemicals and the ways that we're cleaning it. Um, and I love them. <laughs> and he was like, no, no, that's not, um, you're not taking care of it. He was like, and he started pointing out, he's like, you see all of this, you see the rust, you see this. He's like, it's dying. This piece is dying here. You're not taking care of it all. This is what you need to do. You need to go and buy um, sheep fat, sheep tallow, uh, and you need to clean it this many times this way, and it's going to come back to life. Um, our policies that are written within our cultural resource practices is that if the community says we need to take care of it in a certain way, then that's the way we take care of it. Not because institutional tradition of museums says you always use these chemicals and you, that's, they know their cultural resources and it's taking a step back and recognizing that we are not the authority on communities, cultural practices or their cultural resources, that the community is the authority, not us. And that's also shifting that ownership, that's shifting the ownership of authority. And so that's what we did. Um, Kara is in this picture in the yellow uh, and Kara is our director, of our director of cultural resources. And she went to the butcher, got cheap fat and she cleaned it. Uh, and it's really lovely because um, she is very, she, at the moment, she was very traditional cultural resources, but even hearing her talk about how she cleaned the piece, and she said it felt like it took a breath of fresh air. Um, and it looks completely different than what you see right here. Because of that active process, the community knows how to take care of their items. Um, the other thing I want to mention is thinking about institutional truth telling um, and also land acknowledgement. So thinking about our principles and practice, it's more than just cultural. It's not just that great thing that cultural resources does, because so many times it gets kind of pigeonholed into one department, uh, but it's throughout. It's marketing, it's human resources. Uh, we look at it as an umbrella practice. Um, and so when we think about land acknowledgements, we looking, we're looking at all of our um, signage that we put out, everything that we talk when we're on media posts, we're doing land acknowledgement, recognizing that we are sitting on Kumeyaay land. Um, and then also this piece that's highlighted here was on uh, recognizing the colonial legacy and the harm that our facade um, emits uh, every day. You know, people walking past it uh, and what it represents uh, and recognizing we may not be able to change it, but we can also use our power and privilege to start talking to the city and start facilitating conversations to hopefully get it changed one day. Uh, and so what does that look like to make sure that we're constantly truth telling? Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about really briefly is marketing and graphic design. Um, where if you look on the piece that has cannibals at the very top, the original design, and then the final design, um, they're different uh, and they evoke different feelings uh, based upon um, if you look at the pieces and the images. And so the original design, uh, marketing and communications, they um, reached, come to my department to talk through all of their marketing before it hits the front door or before it hits public access. And so one of the things that we talked about is really building that trust and recognizing that they didn't see how this perpetrated colonial harm. And so having those active conversations between our two departments, um, because even if you look about the way that cannibals, the way that it fetishizes type um, this conversation. If you didn't know what our exhibit, because if you go in the exhibit, it's supposed to give you this alternative narrative and talk about how the, the way that cannibal has been used to displace and oppress indigenous people, black indigenous and people of color. Uh, but if you just look at this sign, that's not what it says including the, I never can remember the name of the ship. It's, I always call it a Columbus ship because that's what it represents for me. And it, like, if I would see this, I wouldn't come into our museum. I would call us hypocrites. Um, because you think about it and at the first point of colonization for many indigenous communities, thinking about it, it's at that point of the shoreline. Um, and it continues to replicate colonial harm at the shoreline. Who owns the houses by the shoreline? People who have privilege, typically cis white community members. Um, and even just thinking about bodies were sold at the shoreline. Enslaved people were taken from their home and sold and transported at these shorelines. And so what does that look like to change? We're still talking about our exhibit, but change it to where it's not visually a replication of colonial harm. Um, and so this is the final design is the one that you see. And that's really where I kind of want to end. Um, and I want to just think about how one of the things that we're really working in part of our strategic plan is making sure that our work is not being siloed into a different space, that it's in curriculum, that it's, it's, it's an umbrella approach, um, and that these points of fear, even changing these images, talking about genocide on a piece of, um, like a, a poster that's gonna go outside or it also talks about that we're still open during construction, that's our responsibility as an institution. Uh, and that's something that we really sit in and at every meeting that we're consistently talking about. Um, so I'll end there, thank you. And then let me stop my screen. Thank you, Brandy, and you've given us already lots to uh, 
discussed, but I encourage um, everybody who's uh, listening and watching to pen down any thoughts they have or questions as we go along and then we'll get back to them when we get into the Q&A. But for now, Nibi. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. That was so nice to hear all of these initiatives. So inspiring. Thank you. Um, my name is Nibi. I'm an art historian, the first Greenlandic art historian, in fact. Um, it's easy to become the first when you live in a country with 56,000 people. Um, I work at Nuuk Art Museum, which was a former private collection. I'm the director here. It also sounds very fancy. We are two and a half people doing everything. Um, a lot of the things now I've been listening to what you have said as well, Brandy, and um, some of these things tend to, at our art museum, to be very practical. We start the other way around. It's almost like cleaning sometimes. It's almost uh, dusting off everything. We've talked about how we keep on dusting off the museum because we have inherited some, uh, some problems as well. So that's basically the way I'm going to take you around for this little talk. I have a PowerPoint as well. I'm just going to try to share the screen here. Uh, if it works. Can I do like this? Looks okay, right? Yeah. Um, you talked about changing names, and I think a lot of the things that you have talked about is the same for us. The first thing we did was change the museum name, or at least give the museum a Greenlandic name. Because when I started, the museum is not that old. It's only 15 years old. I've been working here in the past five years. When I started, it only had a Danish name, Nuuk Art Museum, Nuuk Kunstmuseum. And it was so weird because whenever people use the Greenlandic name, they use different names because the translation can be, it can be translated in different ways. I'm going to talk a little bit about it here. The name that we chose was which directly translate to in Nuuk, the first uh, letter, uh, the first um, word, Elkumitulianik, uh, art, Sakomasitivik, place to exhibit. So it's a little bit like art gallery more than it's actually museum. And the reason for that, that was one of the decisions that we had to make. Getzelsurasivik actually means a place where you gather things. And not stories, not art necessarily. It's very, in Greenlandic, it's very practical. A place where you gather stuff that you can hold. It's very low key, like things, things. And we didn't think that that worked for an art museum or for what we wanted to create as a museum or what we wanted to work with. And the other word is then gallery, which is also not completely true because we're not only an exhibit, exhibiting space. We're also a, a museum in the other way of understanding a museum. So we had a struggle choosing which name to use, but it ended up, we ended up choosing the one with Sakumasitiv because we thought the exhibition part of it and the communication part of it was more important to us. The other word is Akumitulyamnok. is um, art directly translated, but it directly translated in Greenlandic, it means to make something weird to ekumik is something weird, something unnatural, something that you, you were creating. Um, so that's also a choice to use that word. It could also have been to make something beautiful. So we have made some uh, decisions on the name that we thought would work. And I thought I wanted to take you through that as well, because those decisions to us have been important to sort of communicate that this is also a it's a it's a place where we want to show something weird and not necessarily beautiful and we want to have a dialogue about it as well um, this is one of the projects we made last year we've been discussing a lot about this uh, i don't see what i don't see and that's one of the key things that we've been discussing before coming to this um, one of our um, dreams for the museum all the time has been not to be the ones seeing all the time, to have others see, as you did, as you have done as well with the inviting others from others community, from other communities to look at the uh, elements from your collection. 
we have done some collection in collaboration with others and tried to uh, also have other who have similar colonial histories as Greenland to invite them to participate. So this was a piece that Shanet Elas uh, placed at a, we're actually doing a new one in two days, a new flag, but it's a flag project made by Gudrun Hesle, who's living in Nuuk, um, curated by her. And Shanet Elas was invited to make a flag for that project. And she decided to make this flag, which uh, says a lot about the things that we've been discussing until now as well. Um, we have to have our own historians. We have to tell our own story in Greenland. We have to be the ones communicating. Um, so that has been the biggest change for the museum, I think, that uh, we as Greenlanders have taken control over the museum now. Um, that we are trying to tell our story and our complete, like, from different angles, not just one, a one-sided story, but trying to sort of broaden this um when i started five years ago this was the entrance at the museum and it has been my guidance ever since people i had a lady entering the space and she just immediately just entering this space she immediately said this is so beautiful this is exactly how i imagined greenlandic art and the only thing that she's looking at is uh, Immanuel peterson which was a danish painter traveling in greenland a hundred years ago um, that's all the paintings on the walls. And then there is the uh, Greenlandic figurines, which is most of them are nameless and they are uh, not a part of the uh, newer Greenlandic art or they are a part of it, but um, we have a lot of newer Greenlandic artists working in different ways. And it sort of ended up with those, only those two kind of art exhibited. And her presumptions just constantly reminds me that that are the presumptions that we're trying to break through trying to break down. We try to change that perception on Greenlandic art because that is not necessarily the only thing that is about Greenlandic art. We've wanted that to be bigger. I'm gonna make an example with the Dubilax, which is the small figurines in the counter. We have the Dubilax here. Um, that's one of the things that if you Google Greenlandic art, that is what you will see. Almost all of it will be this kind of art. And it is an important part of our collection as well. We have a lot of in our uh, collection as well. But the fact is that the story about the Dubilak, everybody thinks it's Greenlandic and indigenous. Everybody thinks it's very traditional and that this is more real Greenlandic art than all the other kind of art because it's more traditional. And, and that's, about, that's a question about perspective because the Dubilak, as we know it today, this part of it um, was it, there is three kinds of Dubilek. The first actual one, which is the traditional Greenlandic one, is a mythical figurine. You can't touch it, you can't see it. It's deadly. You could cast it upon each other as a way of uh, killing your enemies. Um, and it would backfire at you if it didn't kill the one you wanted to kill. So it's a, actually a really dramatic story and um, some has made uh, illustration of these. Uh, this is one of those kind of illustrations. Traditionally, that was what we in Greenland call the Dubilek. So this is our actual Dubilek from before. This is the element that was, would catch the spirit. You would place it on the street, where the, on the pathway where uh, the one you wanted to hurt was walking by or at their bed. Uh, at their bed or in places where it would be able to catch you. And this is the element. And this is the um, oldest one that we know of. And it's made by real baby eyes. So this is sort of almost a Greenlandic voodoo kind of uh, thing. Uh, and that's only around 100 years old as well. But between 150 years ago and 100 years ago, the Dubilek as we know it today arised because the foreigners came to Greenland and asked, what do the Dubilek look like? And we started to carve the mystical figurines as illustrations of these figurines. We started to make these. So these are actually illustrations of that kind of figures. And sometimes you can see very close similarities between um, these kind of figures. So the Dubilek is actually a result of um, 
of communities meeting. It's a result of um, the Europeans coming to Greenland asking what do they look like, these mythical figurines. Um, and it's not to give them less value, but it's to tell the full story. Because one of the things we often lack in the Greenlandic art history and the Greenlandic history in general is the mixed stories. We tend to say this is the, the indigenous story, this is the European story, and you can't divide it in that way. So we're trying to tell the actual story of the elements going through telling different views on the same element. So this is one example of that. Um, another example on that is I told you about Emanuel A. Peterson. We have a huge collection of those because it's a former primate collection. And the uh, uh, Danish carpenter who bought the whole collection was very fond of Emanuel. So we have tons of paintings by Emanuel. And to give perspective to the view Emanuel put on Greenland, we tried to, instead of just exhibit his pieces, we tried to put a focus on what he was looking at and the way he was looking. So. Um, if you look at Emmanuel's pieces, they have no faces. And uh, a lot of his, the same uh, paintings have the same kind of faces. They are looking exactly the same. It's a copy of the same person in different paintings. At the same time as Emmanuel was in Greenland, Jede Bang was in Greenland. She was a Danish photographer. Um, and she only photographed faces and people. And when I ten, tell people that they were here at the same time, people often say, I didn't know that. I thought Emmanuel's pieces were much older. And that's one of the points that we're trying to make with putting more perspective into the same age uh, looking at this. I have another example as well with Ogi Johansson. He was also in Greenland at the same time as Jede Bang and Emmanuel A. Peterson. And while, while Emmanuel was looking at the nature and almost making humans nature, they are not, and they are sort of, um, it's almost a play in his uh, paintings. Yet yeah, the bank was looking a lot in uh, to industry, the industry, but she was also looking a lot at people. It's a lot of uh, portraits. Um, uh, Geert Johansson was looking at culture and trying to uh, figure out how the Greenlandic culture worked. All three of them were foreigners portraying Greenland at the same in 1930s. One of the, 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 my primary way of working has been um, inspired by Pia Aga, a Greenlandic Danish artist who've been working a lot with perspective and um, how we look and what we look at in a Greenlandic Danish context. Um, being in the middle in this, she calls it sometimes the bastard, how to investigate the bastards in history. Uh, the combined history between um, primarily da Denmark and Greenland. Um, this is Arctic Hysteria, a video piece that we bought a couple of years ago. Oh, what I forgot to mention about um, this is the only piece of these that we had when I started was the Emmanuel pieces. We have bought pieces by Jede Bank. We have bought Gitch Johansson because they were not represented in the collection because the one who donated the whole collection to the museum didn't like that kind of paintings, so he didn't buy it. It's the same with the Pia Aga piece. We bought that in 2017 to give perspective to the whole collection we have of foreigners portraying Greenland. We tried to put another focus to it and how we look. This is a soft portrait. I, I highly encourage you to watch the five minute um, video if you get the chance to it. Um, it's a it's a self-portrait where she is breaking up this uh, this image. It's called Arctic Hysteria because it was a, a diagnose you could place a, a diagnose that people of Arctic was diagnosed with disease, um, and it was especially women, and uh, they often were running around naked. So she's sort of acting this, but at the same time staging us looking at her. So we are as a as a spectators uh, almost too close to her, watching her naked rolling around. This is another example of her pieces that we also bought in 2017, where she had put together from the same expedition, um, she has put together males, expedition participants from the same expeditions, and then women from these expeditions. And you can uh, easily see how the views are different. And she made that just 
putting them together, illustrating all of this. And that way of working um, has been buying those kind of things to illustrate what we're looking at and what is looked upon has been important to us. Yeah, I think that was what I wanted to say. Um, we have made um, another expedition project that I, uh, exhibition project that I wanted to talk up very shortly about is Elisa Sinerit Genkennelser Recognitions, where we have asked um, three really well-known Greenlandic olders from the, t the town of Nuuk, and we've asked them to choose five paintings from our collection. They could choose whichever or piece from our collection. It could also be figurines. So they would be the one choosing what they wanted to be exhibited. And it has been our way of sort of staging that our collection is staged. Our collection has been chosen by some someone and to uh, make people aware of the fact that it is not, it's a collection that has been chosen by a white male um, and trying to change the perception on how you choose and what you choose also to put a, a note to the fact that we have put up some paintings by now uh, also stage something. I wrote a piece about it and did a presentation about it where I called it the implied truth in curating Greenlandic art because we are the largest museum in Greenland of only two art museums. Um, everything we do becomes a new truth. And everything we do is to sort of oppose to that truth or trying to tell that it's not a truth that we will back up. We're trying to tell mutual stories at the same time and put aware, people aware of the fact that we have chosen stuff as well. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to say. I've talked more than enough now. Can I leave it? Well, there's definitely a lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe, um, do you have anything that you wanted to sort of like respond to each other about? Because you both raised, um, of course, you're working in, in very different contexts, geographically, uh, culturally, linguistically. But there are things, are there things that either of you said uh, between one another, you thought, okay, yeah, this is something that, um, I mean, you mentioned Nivi, but are there other ways in which you feel your work kind of aligns or, or, or converses? I want oh. to also, sorry, if that's, I, I just want to really quickly recognize like the amount of work that you've done, Nivi, it's amazing. And you just, the fact that you all are a very small team uh, and the way I think, cause I think about the, the story and the truth you'd also just shared is really powerful. And it, it inspires me to like, the, like I feel like um, at the foot of a lot of this work, I feel like many times there's hope that keeps driving us. And I think about the work that you are doing that you have done and that your very small team has done and the impact that you've made uh, from the first photo that you showed of the museum is so it's huge because it was one perspective and it was an outsider's perspective and that's so powerful is even just you and the identity that you hold in the place that you hold and then coming in and shifting that uh, to recognize and it even isn't just shifting it to recognize another just one particular truth but it's multiple truths and i think that that's really powerful and it's sitting in that space uh, and and what does that do to shift an entire um, like global population's understanding of the identity of Greenland and communities in Greenland and Greenland Park? Uh, so I just, I, I wanted to say that it was it just, my mind was like swirling while you were talking. I was like, yes. <laughs> but I think the fun thing about working in a small place is that's possible. Uh, we have days where we sit in the office all day and then we have days where we're tired of sitting in the office and then we go out and move paintings. We don't have a team that we have to consult first. We don't have, uh, we don't have to ask anyone. And um, so that's the easy thing about it. But what I thought about your, uh, what you said, Brandy, as well, was transparency. Because that's basically what we work with as well. 
how to be transparent about the history of the museum, how to be transparent about the histories of the same object and what stories you can tell about the same object. Um, so I think transparency was really one of those uh, things that I could recognize in what you said as well. Um, and also this about being the, the beginning is colonial and how we're trying to, even though this is in Nuuk, it's still colonial and how we're trying to sort of uh, break that or work with it in a way that's profitable for the community or profitable for each of us, how we try to embrace that as a part of the story as well, I think. I have a question, if that's okay, is uh, thinking about um, when you first came into the space, what were some of the challenges that you experienced? Or, and, and did you see, did you have pushback from your board or like, or, or did you have pushback at all from any community members or board of trustees or just, because I think about the, the amount of hurdles of changing something that has always been one way, <laughs> people don't, don't always like change. Yeah, we had a lot of struggle at the beginning, but we don't have a board, we have now. I have, after four years, been able to uh, put down a board together with the municipality. So that's completely new and everything is nice now, but we didn't. Um, but uh, the museum was a former private collection donated by a family, Sven Junge and his uh, family. And some parts of the family st were still living in Nuuk at the point when I started. And they were opposing to our changes because they thought that it was a donation to the municipality and it should be the same. So we have faced a lot of challenges in that way. Um, we still have like, even this year uh, at the day of the birth, the birthday of the museum, uh, it had a 15 years anniversary this year. Even on that day, uh, the family wrote something about they not wanting it to be changed because, and I also at the reception of that day, we had cake and coffee and reception at the anniversary. And I even had a person coming in saying that it was a pity that we had taken all, down so many of Emmanuel A. Peterson's paintings and uh, we have gotten a new one and we should put that one up because that one is needed in the collection and things like that. We're not honoring the donation. But the fact is that those are very few compared to all the other parts of it. Um, we can see that the visiting numbers have raised very much we can see that the students are working with colonial perspectives in a different way in our collection so we can see a lot of uh, positive things about this change but uh, of course often the ones the few who are uh, who not, are not happy about it uh, often tend to shout the loudest but it's like the museum none of the paintings in the collection had been moved for 10 years when i started But I was thinking the same thing about your museum, because I know it's easy for me. I know the changes are easy and easy because it's, I, I started, that's why I joke a little bit that it's cleaning. Because it made maintenance and I can do all of it on my own. My, me and my team can put a nail in the wall and move a painting. But I know that if it had been in any, any Danish museum, I would have to ask the conservators. I would have to do a lot of research. I would have to ask a ton of people. So to me, this is really easy. And I'm thinking I can do a lot of change in very few, few years while you have to do all of the, uh, the other parts of this work, which is to me, it's just like, it must have been a ton of work to you guys just to move one painting, you have to have so much work done before. Yeah, I think, um, because our size is definitely Prior to COVID, we were a staff of around 65 people. Um, and so we had a really large staff um, and we didn't close any days of the week. And so we were all, I mean, the only, I think we only closed for a couple of holidays throughout the entire year. Um, and so it, there's so many levels and protocols that you have to navigate I th and in order to be able to do uh, the work. Uh, and I think that was where we look at, at least how I've approached it over the years is really that structural and that cultural change and what is the strategy of structural and cultural change and like what does it mean to move and slowly keep moving and I've learned a lot of lessons. It's a lot of uh, what I've also learned is it's the amount of physical labor is huge and the amount of emotional labor is also huge. Uh, and sometimes the burden, um, many times the burden of the emotional labor falls on the BIPOC folks um, and, and also in my department because we're having to work through a lot of white supremacy and fragility and colonial pain and also the recognition that they, sometimes the people's 
identities and their careers and their entire lives have been built through this colonial legacy. And so what does that look like to challenge it, especially archaeologists? What does it look like to challenge that and to talk about the impact of like old school archaeology uh, and collecting and cleaning? And what does that mean for honoring scholars and, uh, and not honoring indigenous people? Um, so one of the things that we, I think, has been really powerful that I've seen is like one strategy is that we even with our human remains policy, which was the first policy that we passed, we thought really strategically around what does that look like to have a working group and bringing everybody into that working group, having the board of trustees sitting in that working group with us and having the um, different people at different staff points to sit in with us. So the buy-in is there. It takes so much longer, uh, but we're able to start getting through um, community members are getting through our board. And so that way, when I can't be in a board meeting or someone else can't be in a specific room, they're talking about it or they're talking about it when I don't have to speak. And so then I can talk about something else in the same space. So it's like building this allyship and advocacy and um, these, um, it's, it's really interesting. Like, especially we saw that happening within the colonial um, pathways policy that um, during that board of trustees, when people were in the, the meeting, when people were pushing back and being like, we can't do this, this is scary, this is madness. Um, it was the other boards who were in that working group that stepped up, um, but those working groups were really hard because those board members and all, even the staff were like, this is not, we shouldn't be doing this. And so what we did was we pulled from our history and we integrated those truth tellings into those working groups where we pulled um, archival records. And then um, the director of cultural resources and myself also did a lot of historical research and did some of our own personal um, truth telling around these pieces of colonial harm. Like when we talk about the um, research trip to Australia, that was under this umbrella of white supremacy and the harm that it perpetrated against the indigenous population in Australia and all these cultural resources or the fact that we have military pieces from Apache reservations or that we were kind of as like a trade shop where we bartered with people who were starving and we took advantage of that. Uh, and so telling that in those spaces um, and then connecting that to the larger scope of indigenous identity and genocide was, is really the practice. And it's one of the practices that I've recognized that we have to continue to do uh, because just because we truth tell that one spot doesn't mean that the new people in that space has have heard those truths or remember those truths. Um, because we've had some pushback. It's like, well, this truth telling is awfully harsh, Brandy. You just said we're a monument to colonization. Like, oh, that's pretty hard. Like, what is that going to do? And we are. <laughs> so what is that? So reliving those histories. Um, it's not easy on our staff. Uh, and we have to build in time during those meetings as well to, um, like, I have to take a pause a lot of times. And that's also pulling from some of the, the work around like respecting the pause that we're not stopping the work, but we're reviving and we're thinking about other strategies um, in that pause. So it's not a pause is not a stop. A pause is actually like rethinking strategies or even just building our own energy back. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Uh, I yeah, I got a question for Brand. your position. Uh, I was really mind blown when I heard like director of decolonizing initiatives was like, <laughs> when was this created and uh, on whose initiative? So I think it's interesting because people say they can't, first of all, like, people say they can't do this work because they were like, nobody's ever going to fund it. And I'm like, actually, people funded my position and people are still funding my position. And I was, I mean, and so I think people will fund this, uh, that it's not you, that's, that is again, and one of these fears around repatriation, we can't do, we can do this, and this is the right thing to do. Um, you, there is fundraising, people still come into our doors because we're doing the right thing. Um, and so we, my position was funded by a grant uh, through the Institute of Museum Libraries and Services, uh, and it was a large uh, decolonizing initiatives grant. And we, even just the title, like we went back and forth because in the grant it was written as the, um, director of decolonization and we were like no that's not okay I don't know like I, I think the idea of when they wrote it we're like this is great but if you take a step back and it makes it look like it starts here and in here and we're done this work is not done uh it's always going to continue and always going to change and it needs to be a dedicated point within the museum and so they wrote that in the grant as well that even after the grant that they, this would be a part of the institutional fabric and the, the DNA um, just like a director of cultural resources or a director of education or a CEO um so it's a position that's always hopefully always going to be there because they've committed to it but it was through that grant to be funded for three years um, and then now my position is consistently written in grants uh, for decolonizing initiatives uh, for a, additional other and we're the part of the strategic plan and part of the work is still writing in it uh, but it is it's it is different because it's not something that you can base a job description on and pull from other job descriptions uh, and 
it's also, it's a, it's a really, it can be a challenging title. Like, what does that look like? What does that do? Um, like, what is it? I get people who look at me kind of like with the confused head look um, when I'm in the museum talking about it because they're like, well, what does that mean? Uh, and it's, and decolonizing can be really scary. So, but sometimes, I mean, like I think about the work that Nibi is doing is you're doing decolonizing work. You don't have to say it. Like we can be doing it and not having to say it all the time. And yet we are doing the work. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that we've been working a lot with, uh, how to say it, because it's only when I go outside of Greenland or attend conference like this that we say that kind of words. Like they're not a part of the vocabulary, they're not a part of the way that we communicate locally. Uh, everything is about stories, and that's also why I really like that part, dusting off. It's just constantly dusting off, and you have to do that constantly. You have to change your stories constantly. You have to look at it from a different perspective constantly. I, I, I wanted to ask you a bit more about language. I was going to ask you a question about, you know, what qualities, I mean, both personal qualities, but also on the level of how you work, does it take to, to deal with collections that you, because you've both inherited collections. It's not like, you know, you have an empty space. So what qualities are required to kind of look carefully at what you have and reconsider how they communicate or express to a public? But before we get to that, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the importance of language. I mean, Nivi, you brought this up with your kind of negotiation of what a museum or a holding space or art might be when you transfer it into the Greenlandic. But also, Brandy, you, you use some very, very clear words. You use the word stewardship rather than guardianship or even custodianship. And you talk about cultural resources, which is different from saying the collection, right? Or objects. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the importance of language, both in terms of your own personal practice, but then how it kind of translates to different publics, whether they're uh, policy makers or whether they're, you know, people coming in off the street. Should I start? Uh, we have, language is very low practical to us. Uh, I, I said before this about not using the words of colonialism or post-colonialism or decolonization or all of these uh, fancy words because our uh, visitors and the locals here, they won't refer to it in that way. So we don't either. So we're tr constantly trying to communicate in a language that works and gives dialogue and understanding across the museum. So that's also the language that we usually use. And then there is also this part of it that these kind of words don't translate to Greenlandic. They just don't. Um, you can see the struggle just with our name, just with the word of art. We don't have a word for abstract, for instance. Uh, we don't have a word for non-figurative. So we're trying to sort of work with these words or a description of things rather than the actual word. So we're trying to describe a lot uh, and working with it in that way so we can, uh, tr so it translates to Greenlandic because we constantly work in two languages, sometimes three, Greenlandic and Danish and sometimes English as well. Um, and uh, we know that if we don't write those words, if we don't make that vocabulary on Greenlandic art, nobody will. So we're trying to build up a Greenlandic vocabulary on art in general. We're trying to figure out what do we want to use when we talk about abstract? What do we want to use when we talk about non-figurative? What kind of uh, way do we describe lines in the face in Greenlandic? What kind of way do we, uh, all of this. Um, so, so language is really important to us and we are, demanding a very high level of Greenlandic uh, in our texts. We do a lot of proofreading on it. We do a, we are really, we are um, very aware that the fact that if we use a word to translate it, it will probably be written and used again. So we will have to sort of make it a thing to really figure which kind of words we want to use. So we do that a lot, uh, much more than I think any other institution in Greenland at the moment. Um, there is a lot of really, really bad translation. It's often written in Danish, translated into Greenlandic, and the translation are often very, uh, very poor. So we're trying to make the Greenlandic version, we're not calling it translation, we're trying to make the Greenlandic versions um, just as good or 
just as important or just as reflective as the Danish versions of them. Do you, sorry, I just have a follow-up question about this. Do you have like a reference group for this or how do you guarantee language is still accessible for everyone? Yeah, we, we do. We also use our own staff. We use the student helpers as references as well. We have a, a very good connection to the students. We use different people to proofread it. And um, depending on, we know the translators at the moment. So depending on which kind of assignment it is, we send it to different kinds of proofreaders. And then we have uh, one in-house who is uh, really, really good um, in all three languages. So she's always uh, checking them, making sure that it aligns with the policy of the museum. We actually have a language policy. We don't have that many other policies, uh, but we do have a language policy. So for us, language is super important. Uh, and it was like one of the first steps of shifting um, a lot of our colonial practices. Um, uh, one of the first steps that we took within our cultural resources department was we didn't necessarily, we didn't, we didn't change cultural resources that was to, uh, close to maybe like 1.5 step, uh, but we looked at what does that look like? And the reason we started in our cultural resource department because we wanted to see where colonization was found, like grounded in, and it was, or the colonial paradigm was founded in, and it was in our uh, collections department, in our cultural resources department, and everything stemmed from there, right? And so what we looked at was inside of our cultural resources department that different rooms were called labs, and the ancestors, the human remains, were um, called specimens, and they were doing research on specimens and in lab one, in lab two, and so that was one of the first things that we changed, that that's not, that's not, what we stand for. That's a reflection of course, dehumanizing like this. These are can, pe our cultural resources are connections for people and they are connections to people's past, present and future. They are not an inanimate object. Many of them are not and some communities may see them as inanimate objects and we respect that. But for many indigenous populations that we've worked with, they're not. Um, and we want to make sure that we're also holding space and respecting that too. Um, and so we've shifted, shifted the language to storage rooms because that's where they're staying. We've also shifted our practices of making sure that cultural resources are no longer in a space where it's like all the arrows are here. Uh, no, we're making sure that communities are staying together. So the cultural resources that are related to each other are there together. Um, we also shifted where ancestors and the ancestral human remains. So we also wanna make sure we're saying ancestral human remains versus specimens or just human remains. Uh, because we're recognizing that these are community members, relatives. Um, and so we say a lot of relatives, belongings as well, and shifting that practice. Um, and we also recognize that we have a lot of like mummified um, animals as well. And many times community members see those as relatives as well, and that they are relatives to community members. And so those are some community members' ancestors. So they're ancestor, ancestral um, animal remains as well. And so we've shifted that. We also hold each other accountable in terms of cult, like the outside of cultural resources where we, um, inside of the exhibits, um, that we're talking about it, uh, where it's not just the mummy, that is a human. And so it's a mummified human remain, or it's a mummified animal, or so it's not, and we're, we're actively correcting ourselves as well and, and um, working to shift. Um, and then we do a lot as well, when we think about even just the public display of language, when we think about um, who is on the tag, that is the cultural resource that's on display. And it's always the collector that donated it to us. It's not the people who made it or the person who it is, or it, and so we've shifted that. We don't recognize the collector is not the first name. And many times the collector is not the name at all. That's in our cultural resources archival information, but it doesn't need to be in that exhibit. Uh, and so we have who, the, if we don't know who, it's Kumeyaay Nation or it's Maya community. Um, and then we're shifting to make sure if we do know if it's say one of the uh, indigenous artists that we're saying one of those, um, the, the, their names that are on there first. And then we're giving the details of the cultural resources. Um, but we, that shift uh, is really important that we're not saying graciously donated by, uh, but we're recognizing the community members that it comes from. Um, and we also made a shift to where we, what we saw inside internally for our organizational culture that many times when we were talking about exhibits, even just applying for a grant, they were like, oh, and that's the Maya, or that's the Kumeyaay. No, that's the Kumeyaay exhibit, or that's the Kumeyaay gallery, or that's the Kumeyaay space, or the dome, but it's not the people, and we're not going to be, and same thing with Maya, like it's the Maya exhibit. Maya are people, and we're recognizing that they're people, and so even shifting that, because language holds such power, and we don't want to actively um, 
uh, intentionally or unintentionally replicate colonial harm with some of the words that we're consistently speaking. And even just the space, like we've shifted space around as well to uh, when we talk about where the ancestors are held, um, the ancestors are now held um, in a sanctuary space. They're not, community members are not like dispersed within the other cultural resources holding. They're in a sanctuary space that is locked and on a different code so that they can get some peace. They're not just actively moving and uh, people are, can't just come and interact with them. Uh, and so I think that that was an, an important shift for us as well. And I mean, what you're both pointing to is the fact that um, the um, items and the uh, communities that you look after are living and they're interacting and it's not just, um, um, I'll use the word collections because I'm, you know, we're still working with this colonial language, but I mean, these collections, sometimes um, people can think that they kind of, you, you talked about implied truth, Nivi, and it's like, you know, sometimes these collections can sort of stand in for what once was, and we just mm -hmm. keep looking at it like an old, you know, dying artifact that eventually will just, you know, disappear and be replaced by something else as time moves on. But what you're both speaking to is the ways in which these are animated, um, um, yeah, uh, repositories for, of, of knowledge that keep moving, keep having relevance in the community, but also need to be uh, taken care of with uh, living practices. So practices where you're taking care of um, um, ancestor remains um, as if they are still here. I mean, there's something about that, um, that ethical practice I think is really, um, important, but uh, mm -hmm. it sounds like it's a lot of work. I mean, compared to another kind of methodology, which is like, let's just put things in storage and keep them, you know, I don't know, temperature controlled. I think one of the things that we, <laughs> part of our training, and it's also, I, I mean, and I, I know policy can be work, but shifting that culture of pride and the expectations of cultures was, is it does take longer. And our cultural resources team and anybody we bring into the cultural resource and even just consistently talking to our administration and our development and um, even our grant, like when we're doing grant deliverables, we've said we've done this, but we couldn't necessarily do consultations with indigenous communities because they're busy. They have lives of their own and worlds and other type of priorities meeting with us is not the top priority at this moment. And so even articulating that to our grant, um, grantors that this is just not in their timeline right now and we maybe need an extension or that this is not something that we could accomplish because it changes. Digital active, uh, ac uh, access is no longer on their priority list and they don't want us to do it. And so that is shift from when we applied two years ago. Is that, that's really important. One of the things we've also noticed is that, um, and that uh, I think is unique is Sometimes if you're working with cultural resources in a traditional museum or in a museum and you think about it in collections, you're working with the object and you're going to, you've got three days, you're going to do it. And it doesn't matter what this object and the, the, what it holds in the community. And if there's any kind of protocols or restrictions, but we don't do that. We may be working with a cultural resource that has specific cultural protocols and restrictions that the indigenous communities have been very vocal about that uh, maybe someone who's menstruating cannot interact with this item. Uh, and so we have a large cultural resources team that are menstruating individuals. Uh, and so if that happens, then we have a backup plan and we shift and there's no questions asked. There's no shame. We just shift uh, and make sure that we have something else to work on. And so we may not get to that cultural resource and working with it um, right away. Uh, it may take two months, uh, depending on what happens. Uh, but if it's not an emergency, then we can set that on the side and then move to something else because we want to respect that those are the practices, they are the authority, and they've said that we can't work on it um, in, in these moments and times. Uh, so I think that that's something else that is not, um, I think, we also work through with interns many times with what does that look like? It's like, you may have thought this was your project, but this is probably not, may not be your project within this course of the month. Um, I would like to encourage our participants to maybe send questions or comments. <laughs> yeah, the Q&A portion is open, so just go ahead. Otherwise, can I ask another question? Of course. <laughs> just take the space. Um, so um, over the time that we've been sort of planning for this uh, virtual panel, we've been talking about a number of thematics because the main um, discussion point for this uh, MME um, series of events has been structures. It's all about structures. 
And of course, we've been thinking about these kind of internal and external pressures, physical structures, ideological structures, also some of the vulnerabilities that come with doing this kind of work. I mean, um, you haven't spoken so much about the economy, but I'm sure you, you might want to, to bring it up. But I, I wanted to kind of go to some of the provocations that you know we've been thinking about museums with no objects, museums with no people, which is actually something that's happening now as a result of COVID-19. Um, what do you see as being the possibilities for experimenting with this concept of like, okay, what if everything was taken off the shelves? What if we hoovered everything and, 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 and we started from scratch? Um, or what if we, what if we um, um, ask people to enter this space, um, you know, with, blindfolded in a certain kind of way or, or, or on their knees or like any kind of, you know, um, experiment of how to change perspective, how to change uh, PowerPoints. Uh, have, you, have you thought about any of these as ways to, you know, develop your own practices at all? I don't know, like, um, we are so few people. We are me and my colleague, and then my other colleague who is here part-time. So there is like us to discuss it with. And when I started, we only have 1,500 uh, people a year visiting the museum. So we, the reality was that we had many days without visitors. Uh, we had many days with uh, an empty museum. We have more guests now, and we have been trying to gather more guests. So now we have 6, 1,500, 7,000 a year. Um, so it's quite good compared to the size of the city, I think. Um, and a lot of them are locals because we wanted to, the only ones who came before were tourists and we wanted to make a museum that was also relevant for locals. And uh, if it's relevant for the locals, it will also be relevant for tourists. A museum that is only relevant for tourists would not be relevant at all because they want to learn about something that is actually local so it's some of the things that we've been trying to think about and we people were concerned that we would not get any guests when we did that we had people concerned about that as well so that's not a, a new thing but we've like i don't i don't know we we have very little economy we have very little resources of man men resources and stuff but on the other hand it's we don't have the that stiff structures which makes it much easier to train change and i think i have been through that we've been we don't have the same um people here don't have the same uh, education or the same what do you call it the same they haven't been at a hundred museums where where they have been told to to stay silent so they don't have the same relation to art here. And I think that's a good thing. I mean it as a good thing. So they enter the museum and they tend to touch the artwork on the walls. They tend to go way too close. Uh, they tend to draw on the wall. They sort of pick, we had a drawing thing and they sort of placed it at a painting and started drawing on top of it. And um, we have kids running through the museum and sometimes we have to say, please don't run or, um, but, but on the other hand, we really like that it's not that formal, the relationship. And I think that's a good thing about working in Greenland with art. And uh, we've been trying to keep that going. And we've been trying to, uh, to me, I wouldn't like working in a, uh, with, um, at a, ethnographic collection or archaeological collection in any way because I don't like truths and they tend to have a lot of truths and trying to communicate truth and I think that's why art has always been very close to me because I don't need a truth I, I need to reflect and I need people to reflect so I can constantly not give them a truth and I can ask questions in the collection and we don't know that our collection that well. So that also gives us a reflection on the collection. So I think that's an important part of it um, to me. So we are trying to change that. We also had actually, we had a school children entering the space, lying on the floor, feeling the space. So we have had people asked to lie on the floors, feeling the space. 
So they're trying to listen to the, it's a former church, one part of it. They're trying to listen to the archaeological space of it as well, feeling it. And um, we have a, for students, we have a small thing where you have to count the stairs. You have to uh, make note to how the acoustics are in one space and not the other. So we're trying to sort of make people, I don't know, I don't know. Sometimes it works and sometimes you it feel. doesn't. <laughs> yeah, feel, the, feel museum. the museum. That's right. Yeah. And that's, uh, I don't think it gets more accessible than that. You know, really feel it, smell it, hear it, see it, maybe taste it. You don't know if maybe people has been licking on your walls or your paintings. Like, why They not? might have. Yeah, they might have. <laughs> so. But it's also a question about the Dupilex, for instance. They have been made hold, they have been holding the Dupilex while they made them. They have not been on a wall. They have not been flat. So it's also about giving the feeling. And we know we have tons of duplex in the collection. So if one is damaged because people feel it, it's not a problem. So in that way, we can sort of say, it's okay that something gets damaged. It's okay that you can feel it because that's how it, it was made for feeling. Such freedom. It's easier for us because we don't have conservators telling us that we have to keep it in a different way or something. It's easier for us to say, well, we don't need that piece anyway. <laughs> So I agree, it's way easier <laughs> because, and even just thinking about like that, the, um, the it, it's all sitting in fear, right? Because there's so much anxiety and where is that rooted? It's rooted in fear. They're like, what if we don't have this? It's the same thing with repatriation. People are like, but what are they going to do with it? It's not, it doesn't matter what they're going to do with it because it's not ours. It was taken from them. If they want to burn it, it's they let them burn it. It's their, their items, their belongings. Uh, and so I think that's, um, it's, it's really interesting like how we navigate some of that space. I think that it's also, uh, answering your question is a bit challenging as well for me because I think about the work that we've done uh, around decolonizing initiatives has been very much internally, like really looking at the, um, what is our inside, our exoskeleton kind of looks very similar, but what is the inside, like what is our gut? Because if we're rooted in our foundation and our ground is rotten, then the tree is gonna continue to be rotten. And so we've been, the past five years, we've been really working internally on the, what does that look like around um, changing the ways that people can access and interact. Uh, and, and because I think, and so that's kind of where we sit. Um, and we were on the verge of looking at our exoskeleton and shifting those spaces before COVID. Uh, and now we ended up furloughing around 55, 56 people. Um, and maybe actually it's maybe 51 now because I think we brought five more people on, but that leaves a staff of about 16. Um, and so that's a huge shift and a huge shrink, which means like it also kind of removes some barriers because there's not as many hoops for me to step through to be like, we're going to talk about colonization in this exhibit. But it also means like, what is the capacity? And also like some of the team members who were for this and could do this work are now no longer with us as well. And so I think it presents a lot of layers of like equity and challenges uh, because the, the, our, our team really believed it. And so now with it, with a shrinking, the teams that uh, also believed it is, is not there to help perfect, like do this work. Um, but I, I can speak maybe more towards like internal shifting, if that's it, um, of like what I think about in cultural resources is that shifting of, because I know you're like, people are like, don't touch it. That's how we were five years ago, but that's not how we are now. <laughs> like and we, and we did a public program that was very similar as well, but in our cultural resources and our consultations, when indigenous people come into the space, um, we have all the cultural, majority of the cultural resource, whatever can fit in the space, and we let them know we can bring more if they want to see it. We have gloves, but we tell them if they want to barehand it, it's their belongings. It's their ancestors' belongings, and they are welcome to touch, pick it up. And we also leave the space, um, and we say that you, you're welcome to have private time. We'll be right out here if you need us, and we shut the doors. We're not there overlooking as the authority and, like, gasping when they pick up a basket and inspect it um, because it's, it's their relatives, right? Or it's connected to their aunties and their uncles, and I think that trust um, is really important uh, and articulating that we trust them because we haven't done that from like from five years ago. Like we were there making them put on gloves, making them like telling them they could, they could only look. Um, it's been a huge shift as well. Um, one of the public programs we did that was a part of the grant that funded my position around access uh, it was called, it's called Kumeyaay Community Day. And it was something we worked collectively with the community because the Kumeyaay community said that they 
did not feel welcome and rightfully so we did not let them feel welcome because we have constantly told them that no like researchers could have access to their cultural resources but they could not uh, and we also funded a lot of stealing and grave robbing and um, site robbing uh, and so we um, opened up the entire museum shut it down which is like unheard of for us because a lot of our stuff is like access we have international people coming in from across the globe like so much of our um i think it's like 70 percent of our uh resources coming in is from admissions uh, which is also wild if you think about it uh, but we shut our museum down on a saturday afternoon or a saturday day and only allowed access for kumeyaay community members and we brought all of the cultural resources that we could identify as kumeyaay communities uh, from the different uh, bands and we had them in the cultural resource we had them in the entire museum excuse me um and we had said so that the community could access them look at them look at all the pictures and we would send them copies of the pictures uh and took survey data as well uh but that was huge like community members who don't typically have access because it's 23 dollars to get into our museum <laughs> it's a lot of money um came in for free were surrounded by their own community members across the border because we also did free um, free buses and we had buses at different sites within the, uh, on the different reservations and also at the border so that community members could come uh, from the border and then from the reservations uh, for free to our space so that they also didn't have to pay for travel. But shifting that to be a welcoming space where it wasn't that and where people could touch those items uh, because it was theirs uh, and related to them is, is huge. It's the same thing with when we think about repatriation around the ancestors, we do the same thing. Uh, if we ask them if they want us to help with repatriation to carry the ancestors down from because the sanctuary space is a, a second level. Uh, but if they would rather have only indigenous people carried or only their community members, then we just hold the doors um, and we do what we can. We have a, a handful of indigenous people on staff and if people are available, then we'll also be there. Um, but kind of really looking at like internal structure shifting um, and then now we're hopefully moving into like the Maya exhibit, for example, where we're working on putting up signs to say that this is an archaic oppressive exhibit that is only uplifting scholars. Uh, and this is why it's terrible and working with uh, Maya consultations to uh, do some information around like what should be on display, what should be taken off. Uh, but that truth telling is also a part of like hopefully shifting that space. We were just trying to see whether we had some uh, questions from the room. We don't. But, but people are quiet, probably because they're stunned by your amazing achievements. You're amazing, very powerful women, <laughs> and I'm, 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 I'm very grateful to to know you, but also to be having this, allowing for this conversation to happen between the two of you. I think it's fantastic. Um, so, okay, I'm imagining that um, uh, museum practitioners um, in particular will be interested in, you know, when we share this on social media and so on, will be kind of interested in, in the practical ways in which you're going about your work, but also, you know, like thinking about what are your, your intentions when you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing this work for um, the structures that you work within, but also the communities that you serve. And so just to sort of wrap up, I was just wondering, whether you had advice um, about, you know, what kinds of steps do you take when you know that you have a very, very hefty baggagey collection. Um, you also know that, you know, practices have been dodgy historically. You also know that, you know, communication is a challenge. How do you, mm -hmm. what, what do you advise people sort of focus on or begin with as a kind of um, experiment or something to move forwards? Andy, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> um, so I, I think about where we, because I've been at the San Diego Museum event, it'll be three years in November. So I think about um, the work we were able to accomplish is also a little unheard of in the world of museum because we're pretty snails, <laughs> like we're, we're wonderful, glorious snails, uh, we're, we're slow. Um, and yet we've done a lot in three years, we've done a lot in five years. Uh, but I think about like, where did we start? Because uh, I think I hear that frequently, it's like, this is massive and it's a little overwhelming, where do we start? And I think a really important part that I see within our history and even the work when I think about like what is the next stage that I'm going to take on is taking a step back and reflecting about where where is like at the heart of the colonization exuding from and how is it going to be sustainable change um, because what we started in cultural resources 
Um, we started very specifically with our human remains policy and then have worked through, but we started shifting languages as well, because our pieces of language, because that is also like replications of colonial harm, both intentionally and unintentionally. And so finding these points that we can build off of um, and then also taking and, and asking community members, what do they want? Because we can make a lot of assumptions as what we think that like, they want, but then that's replicating colonial harm as well because then we're being an authority on the community members. But I think that those, those points of like sitting in space and thinking about it is really important because then you can build up from that and you can leverage those success and you can start working with your, your collective group to where it's not just that cute thing that Brandy does or that I really like, with, because if I leave or I say I, I get furloughed or I like <laughs> move on or something like that and I wanna have, I don't know, a falcon farm or a chicken farm somewhere, um, then that work should not die with me. And we saw that in our history, right? Like we saw like throughout the hundred years, we had some really brilliant programming um, and I love educational programming and a lot of my career has been built in education but we had these wonderful moments in time where we worked with indigenous artists like James Luna, where he was protesting human bodies on display and he put his own live human body on display next to ancestors to show how wrong it was. And that was an amazing part in time, even when all of our institution was highly colonial, but that was a moment in time. It didn't, it wasn't sustainable. And I think that that's where we really took a step and was like, what does this look like? Well, we can keep doing all these programs but we need to make a structural change that is going to change the fabric of our organization. And then what does that look like? If we can change the fabric, how does that hold the field accountable? It's like my position, it can be funded. There should be more directors of decolonizing initiatives out there. And it shouldn't just be an anthropology museum. Cause like what we see with Nibi, like there's, it's in art, it's in, it's in the natural history museum. Like when I did paleontology um, ages ago when I was young, um, it's a replication of colonial harm. Like, you're just throwing that dirt away. And for a lot of indigenous community members, those are our relatives. Like we came from the ground and they, you shouldn't be, granted we don't care about the mammoth tusk, which is also really cool, but you shouldn't just be tossing that dirt um, because we are the land and we are connected to the land indigenous people. And so I think that that's like shifting those practices even in the sciences and recognizing that colonization is deeply embedded. Um, but as an institution, where is your colonization deeply embedded and what can you start adjusting that will be sustainable that you can then build up and think about like scaffolding? Because um, I think that we all have those uh, entry points. Yeah, I think you also referred to it with the, the artists who entered your space and how they curated in a different way. And I think asking artists to step in and curate and uh, ask some of the questions that we haven't been able to ask the museums on our own. Uh, I know Pia Age did that, the artist that I was referring to in the in the beginning as well. In my, um, she has done that several times. I know uh, a lot of Greenlandic artists who could sort of step into spaces like this, asking the questions. I know Timmy has done a lot of projects like that as well. And I really think that the artist can be one of the key, uh, one of the key ways to enter a space in a different way and see it in a different light. Um, so I will, would highly encourage that. And I think often we are too scared to change and sometimes we just have to do it. Sometimes we just have to move that one painting. And sometimes we have to acquire, the first step is the most complicated one, I think. Uh, when we acquired the pieces by Pia Aga, for instance, or the pieces that reflect our, our own collection by Yede Bank, the first pieces to buy that first piece was more complicated than buying all the rest of the pieces. Because now we know how we can use those pieces to reflect and to put a different perspective to our own collection. So I think just starting with one piece, just starting with buying one piece then that can put some reflection to the rest of the pieces, buying one performance, buying one whatever. Because um, often it's uh, our collections, as you also mentioned, are uh, have been static. Uh, so I think uh, you, can't, you can work with the collection in different ways, but I think the best way to do is, is actually acquiring new pieces that can reflect on the old pieces or um, at least in art. I think we have a, you were, Brandy, you were also talking about underrepresentation of different cultures all around and that's still how it is today but also um, I think it's also important to hire some of the people who can work with this in a different way I think it was a key for our museum that I'm Greenlandic and I could work at the Greenlandic Museum and I think it's the same with you Brandy um, 
it's important to hire people with cultural, a different cultural uh, heritage. And um, yeah, so I think that's where I would start. More indigenous art and more indigenous curators. Yeah. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> yeah. We didn't get a question, just a comment that says, this is amazing. Thank you all so much for sharing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all for having us. And also for the people who are attending, we really appreciate you spending your time. Uh, I think it's uh, it, different time zones, but I'm sure it's afternoon or evening and for many of you. And so I really appreciate that and just holding the space that um, Anna Marie and, and Timmy that you all have held, um, I think is really valuable and just the thoughtfulness of the questions that you've asked. Uh, and also just, I'm so inspired by your work, maybe. And so, yeah, <laughs> I'm really grateful to be in this space this morning. It's morning here, by the way. So. <laughs> Great. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all of you for being here, participants and Nivi and Brandy, thank you for being here and for your work. <laughs> it's so inspiring yeah. and yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You too. <laughs> See you soon. Brandy, I could I couldn't say it better myself. I'm really inspired now as well. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye